That's not what anyone's saying. It just means these pieces that you, the, the privileges that you carry don't make your life harder. And that's like that kind of, you've still had a hard life, still fought for what you did. No one's saying you didn't. It's just, you haven't had these additional challenges. Welcome to another episode of the Living Out Loud discussion series. Today, we are talking about how to be responsible with your privilege with Lindsay Messelein. I am your host, Charmaine. It's a relational DI expert. If you are new here, we are unpacking real life scenarios and issues that come up in our interactions in professional settings or in settings where we feel like we need to be buttoned up. The goal of every single episode is to reveal the layers in those interactions so that we can learn about them as a community that cares about diversity, equity, and inclusion. As always, the thoughts, views, and opinions, the things that are said in today's conversation, they are my own and not as a representative of any of the agencies that I work for or am contracted by. Now with me, I have Lindsay Messeline. Thank you for showing up today. Hello. Thank you for having me. I knew that we were going to be friends as soon as I met you, and I have not even known you that long. We no. met in the summer about, I don't know, six-ish, five-ish months ago at a networking event, <laughs> and I felt so out of place, so out of place. And I don't know what it was about you, but we just gravitated towards each other and started talking. Yeah. And I felt, oh, my goodness, this is a person I want to chat with. I don't know. Do you remember when we first met? Like, what were you thinking? I, I mean, I felt the same way. I felt incredibly out of place. Like, I'm a teacher. I don't really do networking events. I don't even really know what that word means. Obviously, relationship building, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as I saw you, I think we like made a joke too about like how we felt and then immediately I was like okay I'm gonna send by Charmaine this entire event <laughs> because we have, we're on the same page here and we can get something valuable out of it like meeting each other but we can also like call call it out for yeah. what it is absolutely and the more we got into our conversations too I felt like your story I was really surprised I made a lot of assumptions about who you are by how you look you know, as a white woman. And when I started hearing more and more of your story, I was like, okay, there, there's a lot more to this person. I would never have known had I not spoken to you. And yeah. it'd be really easy to go to an event like that and just yeah. not, I really wanted to just isolate and go back to the hotel room. I just didn't want to do any of that. But there was a lot that I was thinking about myself and having conversations with you and some mm -hmm. other people as well. That you just, every time you share more and more, I realized there's a lot about your journey and this internal process that you've gone uh -huh. through that I felt and still feel is going to be very valuable, especially given today's topic about uh -huh. privilege and, and using it responsibly and having, I think we talked about like a healthier relationship right. with it. Yeah. I haven't really used that term before, but that feels very good to me. So I just know it's going to be a good convo. <laughs> I know too. I felt exactly. Okay. Same. Okay. Yes. Would you mind taking some space and sharing anything about yourself, your own introduction? Sure. So my name is Lindsay Medline. Uh, I'm from what we now call Oregon originally, um, but I'm now based in what we now call New York. I've been a teacher primarily for about 23 years now. So all of my adult life, I've been teaching. I've taught kindergarten to college, but the last 15 years specifically, I focused on adult education. So working with immigrants and refugees, formerly and currently incarcerated populations, and anyone needing to progress through life, getting educational certifications, degrees, et cetera, the things that kind of open up some of those doors. I've lived abroad. I speak Spanish fluently. I'm an interpreter and translator. I also speak a functional level of French, which is new for me. Yay. I love learning language. I love learning in general. I'm also a writer. So I am a, a contributing writer to an educational publication on Medium called Educate. And I published a few pieces on my own, including a, a textbook for learners. So I love education. I love to write. And I really, really love having conversations that like center us as humans, like human beings in a common space with similar goals. 
like one of my favorite things. And I think I also really love just being very honest and direct about life. I don't like, like when you said buttoned down, I'm not a buttoned up person. I don't, certain norms or societal things, like I understand, I'm like, okay, I can do this. And some of them just like, no, but doing that, well, I wouldn't do that. Well, examining where those things come from and then questioning them and then setting my own terms. So yeah, I'm super excited for the conversation today. And yeah, let's go. Yes, let's go. I feel called to at least reference that moment when we were at the conference and I remember I referenced you mm-hmm. and I I referenced you to a group of people. And then I went internally this whole time and I'm like, oh my gosh, I just made this assumption. I don't know if these things are true about her mm-hmm. and decided in this moment to publicly acknowledge, mm-hmm. hey, I just said this thing. I don't even know if it's true. <laughs> And when I said it, I didn't know you well. I just met you. So there was an element of, you're going to say this thing in this place. And I, it was the type of place that was going to be different for them. Like, just yeah. I knew it was going to be different yeah. to just say this in front of everyone. And then I didn't know you. And I said it to you in the place where everybody was. It was this major risk. I said, oh, my gosh. I feel like I have to do this. And then I have no idea how this is going to go. So then I say it and I look so much. <laughs> and you're like, oh, yeah, no, that you were just so cool about it. You're like, makes total sense. Yep. And I remember feeling, oh, my gosh, you are so down to have yes. like conversations in front of people and just it's fine. It's not a big deal. Let's just talk yeah. openly about it. So thank you for that, because I legit had no idea what's going to happen. You were part of my first experience of doing something like that. And it didn't go terribly wrong. It was cool. Yeah, it was. That was a yeah. it was a good experience because, like you said, it, it does represent like how I feel about things. I, I, we just be yeah. direct and honest and open. And the assumption you made was exactly right. So, yeah, you're right. Let's keep moving. What else can we say? <laughs> so, yes. 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 OK. I feel like a great place to start is to be very clear about when we are saying privilege and when Mm. we're saying uh, to be responsible with it, when we're saying have a healthy relationship with it, to shine a light on what that means. I feel like, mm, I don't want to say many, but I do feel like there are plenty of people who understand privilege, but not everybody does. So could we just start there? You can share anything about it, but just one, what is privilege? And then when we say use it responsibly, what are we talking about? And what does that healthy component look like? Any thoughts to share there? Yeah, I mean, what a great place to start. I mean, it's a huge question, right? But like thinking about it in realistic, bite-sized yeah. term, to me, like when you look at the way society functions and who holds power and why do they hold power and what kind of power are we talking about? Political power, economic power. Um, the ability to vote, the ability to own things, like having, and again, like we're a capitalist culture. So the more you have, the more value you have, which I don't disagree with, but that's the the fight in which we live. So who is able to have stuff and why? Who is like deliberately not able to have stuff? And then going like beyond the having, it's like, how do people see me? What do people think about me? Um, Where am I safe because I look a certain way or I can do a certain thing? Where am I not safe? because I look a certain way or I can't do a certain thing. Um, so for me, that's how I look at privilege. You know, I'm obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but my eyebrows are blonde. So I'm like naturally very white and blonde person. I have Lithuanian and Irish heritage. Um, my family's like pretty recent for white people to the, to what we now call the U.S. My family came like in the late 19th century from Ireland and the early 20th century from Lithuania. Um, like, you know, poor immigrant families not coming from any generational wealth, not bringing property with them. You know, a lot of them stole away some boats that they, you know, refugees, right, basically. And what the world they came into might have been different. I know a lot of people love to talk about what the Irish have been through in the U.S. and whatever. But where I am now, what does the world think of me now? Where are the spaces I can go look in the way I look, speak in the way I speak? to be safe, to thrive? Like, where are the spaces I can go to thrive? And where are spaces that I have to keep an eye out for or my own safety because of the way I look or the things I can or can't do? And for me, that's just, so again, I'm a white woman. I'm cisgendered, um, which is a major privilege. 
I'm not, I'm not heterosexual. I'm very like pansexual. I'm attracted to all kinds of people. I've had romantic and sexual relationships with all kinds of people. Um, you know, men, women, trans people, non-binary people. I grew up really poor. So, you know, I've had some of these real challenges in my life. But again, when I think about the privileges that I have and the marginalized identities that I also have, that's where I start. Like, where am I able to thrive? Where am I able to be safe? Where am I not able to thrive? And where am I not able to be safe? And keeping that in mind as I move about the world. And in our conversation, too, like one of, I think we'll get into this because it's like what the conversation is centered around. The, oh, wait, pause. I need to acknowledge that you just said a lot of stuff. It just computed a little later. Like it <laughs> came delayed. Thank you for sharing all of that. Like, hello. hello. This is also me living out loud. Like sometimes my brain goes so fast and yeah. it is what, 323 and I just did this <laughs> and I'll keep doing it. Which makes my brain go faster. So before I do that, I want to stop and say thank you for sharing that. There's even more information in that that I did not know. I appreciate you. And what I was then going to say was there's part of your just the way that you've come to be with your privilege mm -hmm. that feels like you, you understand it and you live with it and you like work with it you haven't come to this place where or you've moved past the place where you acknowledge that privilege is real and that you have it and you moved past the difficulty it's uncomfortable like how do i say something about it you really moved through that and you're at this place i feel like you are I have experienced you to have a good relationship with the fact that you have yeah. privilege and you acknowledge it and you use it and it feels like you are using it responsibly. Mm. And for me, I want to add that layer to when I'm saying use it responsibly, it's what I'm describing. It's at this place of knowing you have it in certain contexts, at certain points in time, depending on, because even though you were saying you have different parts of your identity, different parts of your identities in different places change the privilege that you have there. So it's right. very like complex. And then the responsibility is knowing that and knowing that in any given moment or time, there might be part of my privilege that impacts that space and that's okay. And I don't have to be mm -hmm. uncomfortable or angry about it or retreat or mm -hmm. dismissive. I come in here and I actually know this is literally part of me. And what does that mean for this space or this group of people or this opportunity? And I roll with that, knowing that, mm -hmm. and that's using it responsibly versus where people might know they have it or don't want to admit that they have mm -hmm. it. And then don't engage with a part of themselves and don't engage with a part of the group because of the feelings of privilege. And if there's an impact on the connection points with people. There's an impact in the connection in terms of what people are trying to do together, if it's decisions to be made, if it's projects mm -hmm. to be worked on. So that responsibility piece is, hey, what do you mean? I get it. It's in me. And I'm showing up knowing it's a real thing and I'm here with it and all that that means. Mm -hmm. And I believe that doing that is healthy and doing that with other people is mm -hmm. the healthy relational component to it. I've seen you do that. Again, I haven't known you that long. I haven't mm -hmm. been in all the spaces, but I've seen you and I've been with you in spaces and I felt like, you know what? That's a thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. People haven't seen too much modeling of mm. let's just own what it is y'all yeah and that don't mean that we can't work together yeah and you yeah. look like you want to say something i really want to know what it is oh, no, i'm just like wholeheartedly agreeing with everything <laughs> you're saying i think the specifically white privilege like that one obviously seems to be like at least, you know, I, I come from a very white state and it was deliberately made white. You can read the, the state constitution of Oregon to learn more about that. We now call mm. Oregon. I highly recommend that. Mm. I, I think you said really important words like the discomfort, the retreat, the desire to retreat. I would throw in guilt. Yeah. I know a lot of white people who have a ton of guilt about the white privilege they know they have and that's where they're stuck. And then I know those who just like completely dismiss it and 
I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to use white privilege as the example, but this, I think, is true of any type of privilege. I think it's important to point out I don't have a physical disability. I don't have a documented mental disability either. And so I have like able-bodied privilege. Uh, you know, there's lots of different privileges we could use, but I'm going to use white privilege because I think it really is like that one that touches people. Fun is ah. And we've all, I think we, I don't know who said this quote, but I've seen it and I've shared it a million times is white privilege does not mean that your life has not been hard. It means that your skin color mm. didn't make it harder. And so like for me, I grew up, I come from like a ba- like almost the first generation immigrant household. There was no generational wealth. I went to college on the Pell Grant. I didn't even have loans. I had no loan because my economic level was low enough to qualify mm-hmm. me to go to school for free. I also chose a state school in my home state, but yeah. we didn't have a lot of money. We qualified for public assistance, all of those things. I had to work my butt off to do the thing. I graduated in three years with honors from the University of Oregon, go Ducks. But I... It doesn't mean that I haven't struggled and had hard times. I'm also a survivor of abuse, trigger warning. I'm a survivor of sexual assault. I've had all kinds of hard human experiences that regardless of my privilege, I've still had. But then it's right. But if we do look at trigger warning again, sexual assault, being a Black woman, being a Latino woman, being an Asian woman, the the chances of me being sexually assaulted actually go up. But it's really terrible to go through sexual assault. It's horrible that being a Black woman would have made that situation even harder because I would have been less listened to by the police. I would have been less respected or whatever it is that society does when Black women come forward with their stories. So it's not that I haven't, I just skate through life. I, that's not what anyone's saying. It just means these pieces that you, the, the privileges that you carry don't make your life harder. And that's like that kind of, you've still had a hard life. Still fought for what you did. No one's saying you didn't. It's just, you haven't had these additional challenges of a major physical disability preventing you from being able to enter a building that was designed for people without physical disabilities. Or walking into spaces, if I call the police, they are going to work their butts off to protect my little blonde face. And that's not the case for everyone. So it's just like ex- Accepting that there's these pieces that don't make your life harder. And if you can accept that and realize that, then you can say, okay, it's not denying the work I've done in life, but it's acknowledging that people, Mm. other people are working just as hard as me and not getting the results I'm getting because of their oppressed or marginalized identities, period. Okay. You also said a lot of things. I said a lot of things. I'm not concerned about all no, it's not a criticism. It's like, a oh, there's so much to do with what you're saying. And one of my things is if there's a bunch of things I'm trying to figure out. What do I want to do with all of this? Yeah. So that was me. OK. One part of it was the acknowledgement of when we're saying privilege, white privilege, we're not saying what you said. I feel like that's important. One of the most consistent things that when people are at that place of wanting to distance themselves from it is, no, I've had the struggle. And that's not the conversation that we're having. Right. Just let's just start there. That's not it. So thank you for saying that. That's important. And the like the the intersectional piece, and maybe we can spend a little bit more time here. Intersectional piece, meaning that we have different parts of our identities. Mm-hmm. There's, I don't even know if it's the right way to say that, but there's multiple, we are multifaceted people. We are. And when you were saying that I have these parts of me and in certain situations, I could be impacted or targeted mm-hmm. or whatever it is. I could not have privilege in certain spaces. Yeah. And... Even when I don't have privilege in certain spaces, there's the existence of my privilege. One, there's parts of my privilege that exist in those spaces yep. and outside of. Yep. I'm remembering, I won't tell your story, so I won't do this, but there's a piece I want to speak to if okay. I won't reveal any parts of that story. You have a part of your story where you were in a situation and you had experienced a lot of targeting a lot of maybe like abuse i don't know what the right word is but you had experienced a lot of targeting and 
like abuse in some particular way and in a professional setting. And in your reflection of that, you were like, actually, this really sucks. These are all the various ways. And somehow still in that situation, yeah. I also had a level of safety in yeah. that because I'm white. And I sat back. I said, whoa, I really, because your experience was pretty gnarly. Yeah. And not great at all. And instill that also saying, and, and I also had some safety in there that is not afforded to other people. So also, what does that mean? I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, and again, you don't have to tell the story or anything. I just, I'm calling up that you have an ability to see the, mm -hmm. the, the pieces of the whole situation. I'm oh. curious to know what you think, though, about what I'm saying. Yes. Oh, I mean, so there's like two pieces there. I, I definitely can tell the story. I'll leave out the fine-tuned details because I still don't trust those people. But the other piece that I want to say is, of course, comes from a Black woman. Like, my best quotes are all from Black women. Like, let's just be real. This quote is from E.J. Oma Oluo, yeah. who is a New York Times bestseller, Nigerian-American author, activist, right? Just phenomenal writer. If you don't know her or if you do know her, go and read her again. Her social media is also very active. She has blogs you can subscribe to and she's published books. But she has this amazing quote that whenever I run workshops and talk about like, respect in the workplace or whatever it is, I always bring up this quote. And again, I'm going to paraphrase it. But she says, when we talk about privilege, we're not saying that people without privilege are always right and people with privilege are always wrong. We're simply saying that there are missing pieces of the puzzle. And so when you describe like all of these pieces that kind of work around and contribute to who you are as a person, it's like there are a lot of missing pieces you don't have. I have no idea what it feels like to, yeah, to live with a permanent physical disability. I don't, I don't have that. You know, I've been, I've been injured a few times. I used to be an athlete. I had a sprained ankle. That sucked. But okay, is that a permanent disability? No. Is that my entire life experience on a daily basis? No. Do I know what it's like to be a black man? And I'm driving a car and I have a taillight on. There's a police officer behind me. No. I have no idea what that is. And it's not about me being wrong just because I'm white. Well, you're white, so you're wrong. Well, you're able-bodied, so you're wrong. That's, I don't know how people get that message, but I love the framing that Ijeoma Alua offers. It's not about right and wrong. It's missing pieces of the puzzle. So if I just simply, if I remove the emotion from it and simply ask that question, what are the missing pieces of the puzzle for me? Period. Like all the emotions have been removed. I mean, I love emotions. I'm not saying remove the emotion, but if the, if the emotion is what's stopping you from really pushing forward and having a healthy relationship with your privilege, then just ask it that way. What do I not know about? Where can I go to learn about it? And how can that inform the way that I think about my life and others' lives? To me, that's the most mm. beautiful framing and question. Of course, it's a black woman. Thank you. Praise where it's due. Um, <laughs> The story I can do, this one I can do concisely. So I worked in a very infamous jail. I was teaching, I'm a teacher, I was teaching GED, I was teaching English, teaching Spanish, lots of classes going on. I had huge successes to the point where the jail wanted to hire my organization and wanted me to train all of the educators coming into this space because of how much success I was having. All my students were black and brown men. And I am, you know, very blonde white lady. But no matter what, it was like I would go into these spaces and just be able to connect with the learners and make real progress every week. For whatever reason or all the reasons I'm sure we all know, like, you know, how dare you come in and treat people who are awaiting trial like human beings? So I got a lot of hate from the employees who worked there. I had some support from the employees also, which I can say. But I had a lot of, what is it that you're doing? A lot of suspicion. Like, why are you, how, why do they like you so much? That's what I got a lot. Um, and then just some, um, wild accusation about my behavior and my relationships with the men. And obviously everything's on camera. So I was like, please roll the tapes, like roll all the damn tapes. Because I've been teaching for 23 years and you think I'm going to come into this space, risk my organization and my life and my career and my reputation to have an inappropriate connection with someone who is awaiting trial and being treated like a worse than an animal. What are you saying? I don't, it's so ridiculous. Obviously, everything was, everything is okay now, but only because six or seven months have passed and I never got official communication. 
but I was being treated as though I was guilty before proven innocent by even the higher ups in this space. I love how I said I was going to be concise and I told like a 30 minute story. Oh, well, still it. But I was being treated like so similar. I could feel the weight of the carceral state of just this. Every, I would walk into rooms and people who didn't even know me were talking about me. It, it was like emails were going. And so I saw someone's email. And I was like, they don't do it. Like, they don't do it. Like, what's going on? So this, this, she's so guilty. She's so bad. I was defined and labeled as one thing, which is what happens to our brothers and sisters who get locked up, right? Like they are criminal, delinquent, felon, whatever those labels are that we just use forever to, to excel in, forever that title just follows them. And I, for the first time as a white woman, was just being crushed by the weight of that. I quit all my other jobs. I like tripled up. I like scrambled my money together to pay for counseling because my health insurance didn't cover it. I was having like literal breakdowns, panic attacks. And even so, my sister's a lawyer. And I'm not going to lie. My sister said this in the same way that I would say it. She said, they are 100% targeting you. And they may or may not build try to build a case against you. She said, but the reality is the second that it leaves that space where things are so ugly, it's going to go really well for you. She goes, this is not fair. She literally prefaced it with, this is not fair. She, but they don't actually drag down people who look like you. Mm. Word mm. for word, that's yeah. what she said. And I was mm. like heartbroken mm. by the solace that comment brought me. I mean, first of all, I did nothing wrong. Like, first and foremost, I did roll the damn tape. I did nothing. <laughs> I stand by every action yeah. I did in private that and I'm proud of preparing those students and making those connections. But even if they tried, they, you don't have to have done something wrong because the carceral state is punitive for being punitive. Like it's punitive for punitive state. And yeah. they drag my brothers who are in those spaces for literally nothing. The space I was in is one of the most deadliest, notorious spaces in America. And it's a pre-trial detention center. They haven't even been convicted. And people are dying. Mm -hmm. People are dying of medical neglect, suicide, all these things. And so, again, I was able to feel that weight for the first time as a white woman, but then know that my white womanness was what would save me even if they tried to do a smear campaign, which they didn't in six months. I'm assuming they're not going to. I hope this doesn't come out and be like, let's do it. But even so, I... Uh, like, I am confident in, in my innocence, but aside from that, they don't tear people down who look like me. People who look like me typically don't rot in jail. Yeah. Yeah. And both of those yeah. things are true. And again, but I, what saved me was the time passing and my sister, who's a fabulous lawyer, re reassuring me that, like, at the end of the day, my whiteness literally would save me. And that is heartbreaking. It just is. Mm -hmm. A part of me is just okay. There was a significance to the story that you just told. There's lots of pieces. There's your experience. And then there's, I just have my own personal uh, attachment. It's an attachment. It's an attachment mm. to the experiences of people who are incarcerated in the sense yeah. that I feel something there. There's that. And then there's the other part of the topic that we're actually talking about. So I don't think there's any one thing to do with it. I just want to acknowledge yeah. that there is the presence of your story and your experience. And it's real and important and significant. I'm really sorry. And it also sounds like even though it's six months later, there's just, it's still around. Yeah. It's like a not fully wrapped up, like an uncertainty about that. So I, yeah, that's a real thing. And also, if there's any part of this, if you're like, I actually want to cut that out, then that's what we're going to do. <laughs> and no. that's okay. Tell it. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then, yeah, there's nothing I can do other than about the middle part, which is yeah. people who are incarcerated. I just blah, yeah. can't stand it. And that's yeah. my own like familial yeah. attachment to that. And to zoom out, maybe that could be its own. Yeah. So but topic wise, there's also like the context that we're talking about and not the context, the various parts of who mm -hmm. you are and the more information, the more information about a situation. And these things are true when we're interacting with each other, mm -hmm. when we're in various professional settings, there's 
sometimes I feel like when, when we're in spaces, we have privilege and we don't necessarily like it very much. And then we're in a space with people who may not have as much privilege. Mm. And then there's this like struggle. It almost feels like some battle that comes up. Like I've experienced something too. It feels very competitive, you know, like I want you to know I've had a hard time too. And it's, The point of knowing privilege isn't to then enter a competitive space to be like, who's had it harder? Can you figure it? But that's what it kind of feels like. Yeah. I feel like what using it responsibly and using it healthily Mm -hmm. looks like is you actually have an understanding of how some things look and feel. Mm -hmm. And you have that and you were talking about things existing at the same time. You can probably connect with people based on an understanding of an experience. And then there's parts of it you don't fully mm-hmm. get from another person's point of view because you that's not your lived experience. Right. That's okay. Can it all be held? And what does that mean in this particular situation with this person? Or what does it mean with a group mm-hmm. of people? Mm-hmm. What gets missed? What gets missed, I believe, is there's not enough people who have arrived at this place of being okay with having privilege and having a healthy relationship with it, knowing it so well that you know what it means for yourself and you know what it Mm -hmm. means for other people in those spaces so you can use it. Yeah. I just, I feel like hearing like that story to me gives a really good context for how you are in spaces. You can Mm -hmm. hold what you're experiencing and what that means and you hold the complexity of what it means for other people. Mm -hmm. And then you adjust accordingly. And I feel like that's the part that I really am hoping people can get to. That's Mm -hmm. what changes your interactions with people. Yeah. If you weren't using it responsibly, I don't want to say that. I'm going to say it. I already said it. What it could look like if you weren't further along in your journey is Mm -hmm. you've had this experience. And now when you interact with other people and maybe you impacted someone or maybe someone sharing their own journey. You may, from your less developed sense of self Mm -hmm. here, many want to share yours Mm -hmm. or have yours be held more weight or not be held accountable because, you you know, like, you know what I'm saying? Yes, I do know what you're saying. like I'm saying stuff and I just don't know if I'm capturing it well. (laughs) Well, I think the piece that, I mean, one, yes. I just have a resounding yes to everything you just said. I think that, I think, first of all, there's that competitive piece, which I also think is like um, like a tool of our oppressors. Like, they do want us to compete, you know? Because if we can just eliminate each other, that they can just keep sailing away on their yachts, you know? Like, oh, let mm-hmm. them get each other. Let them waste their time debating yeah. who has it harder instead of working to, like, remove these barriers for everyone. It's a win for the oppressors when we all sit there and do that, first of all. But I think there's also, again, if we think about like missing puzzle pieces, there's a major win there. It's not about more or less. It's just missing puzzle pieces. Like, where can I go? What can I learn? What do I not know because of my lived experiences? There was something else I really wanted to say, and now it's it's escaping me, but I don't know what. Maybe it'll come back. It was about the battling, but then also the things at the same time. Well, we may get to that because I know there's a couple things that we wanted to chat about. And so... I feel like you'll make your way to that. I'm sure I'll come back. But I want to ask you, sure. can you, okay, it might be helpful for people to understand like how you got to this place. Like how did you, I'm imagining you didn't just wake up one day and be like, you know, I got it, privilege. You know, like it <laughs> couldn't have been just a marriage yeah. one day. Like how did you get to this place that you're at where you're like, cool, it's, you're not fighting it. Yeah. Okay. Well, one, I did remember what I wanted to say. And two, I love this question. So the first other thing I want to say is I want to just say that I think the biggest thing is for me with privilege is that having belonging to a marginalized identity or having a marginalized, racialized, minoritized identity does not cancel out the privilege that I have. And so that's not only do we not have to battle it, but both things are true. And so you, it's, it's not like a, well, because I was poor. I don't have to worry about my white privilege as much because I'm pansexual, because even as a white woman, I couldn't get credit until the 70s without a dad or a spouse. I'm good because I've experienced this all. I don't have to. It's no belonging to one identity or having a marginalized identity does not cancel out the privilege that you have. And we can come back to that later, too. 
But so this all started, I can say I was in sixth grade. A counselor came into my very white school. There were three black students and like five Mexican students. Now Oregon's demographics obviously have changed after NAFTA and all that goodness, which could be an entire other episode. But this counselor came in to our sixth grade class and said, I'm going to show you this video. It's very sad, but it's important that you guys know about it. And so they put it on and it was like civil rights marchers, primarily black, like in the 50s and 60s, being sprayed down with fire hoses, being attacked by dogs. I like started sobbing. I was like, release the white tears. Like I was sixth grade. I was just like, what is this? Like, this is the world they live in. What are you talking about? And I and then yeah. they just turned it off and they said we could talk about it. I was just like, whoa. Okay, don't even go to recess. You know, it's just like I don't know how anyone watched that and then just kept it moving the rest of the day. Here I am at 41 years old, about to be 42. I mean, I've oh never, I could tell you what the counselor was wearing that day. And I just, I remember thinking like, I don't think I said, well, I'm white, so that wouldn't happen to me. But I think those insinuated messages were like, it's because they were black that this happened to them. Started there. I went to the University of Oregon. I was majoring in education. I didn't really like it. The classes, no, no like shade to that program. It just wasn't exciting me. I was like, I think I can be a good teacher without these classes. And that's not true for everyone, but that's true for me. And I, I was back in the day, and so I open up the, like, actual physical catalog, and I'm, like, flipping through, and I come to Ethnic Studies, which was a brand new program at the University of Oregon. And it said all the staff were, I don't know what the word was at the time, people of color, whatever the term was at the time. It was, like, very clear that my teachers were going to be Asian, Black, Brown. In the state of Oregon, that's really hard to come by. It's hard to come by anywhere, really, but, like, particularly in Oregon. And so... I just thought whatever I felt in that sixth grade moment, obviously other things had happened along the way, but this was like, this is it. This is it for me. So I signed up for the program. I went to the office. It was only the second year of the program. I met all the staff and I was just like, all I know is that no one in my circle has ever looked like this. And if there's an entire program dedicated to this, I have to learn about it. And then there I went and I started on Ethnic Studies 101, started in my class, off I went. And I ended up, I graduated with honors. I had a tiny little graduation class at a huge university. But there was only two white people who even graduated from that major that year. And I was one of them. And I remember at the graduation ceremony, the professor who was like introducing me to get my diploma was like, if you want to see a deer in the headlights as a person, you look at Lindsay in the first year of her ethnic studies classes. I was literally probably just like this. Wait, what? Wait, what's redlining? Wait, what? But, you know, like it was just like these like. And, and there was so much discomfort. You think it was comfortable being like one of the only white students for the first time in my life, hearing about what people who look like me had done for the last 400 years in this country. I was just like, every day was a personal reckoning. But I kept being like, Look, just, but, but just keep doing it. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. You can, but you have to work to unsee it. And it was more work and more pain for me to unsee it than it was to deal with the discomfort of seeing it. Right. And I think I just mm. would challenge everyone. Like I was described by like a person with three doctoral degrees like, as a deer in the headlights at my graduation. We all have to go through those it's moments, just, but just sit there. And, and again, remove the emotion and be like, it's missing puzzle pieces. It's missing puzzle pieces. Like where can I, how can learning about this make my life better? How can learning about this make other lives better? Period. And I, I had all the questions that everyone has, like, why don't we have all white fraternities? And he was like, like every fraternity is an all white fraternity. And I was like, <laughs> then he was like, why don't we have white history? Month? Every month's white history. I was like, oh, noted. It was like, I had all the same questions that everybody had, but it you know, didn't just wake up with a fairy who touched you on the head and was like, you now get it. I had to sit through the discomfort. I had to wrestle with it. I was ostracized by so many members of my family. Like, I was ruining holiday dinners long before 2020. I didn't know, but I was bringing, like, <laughs> hot topics to the table. And I was, like, ostracized until 2020. And everybody came crawling back, being like, oh, this is what you were talking about. Like, I mean, I say better late than never, but yeah. just, like, just accept it. There's way worse things than feeling a little uncomfortable talking about privilege. Like, come on. That's the worst thing that happens to you today. Like, what a damn good day you just had. I also felt it. You just have to sit through it. And then you just say, 
it's a missing puzzle piece. It's a missing puzzle piece. I want to get, I want to complete this puzzle. And you're never going to complete it, but I want more pieces. I want more understanding. Life is better when I know more, like period. So just, just pick up the puzzle pieces, learn, listen, be uncomfortable. Yeah. Yes. That's my long answer. I, it's your answer. It's, I'm not worried about it being long or anything. I like the, I feel like it doesn't matter who I'm talking to. There's this theme of it doesn't feel good. That, that there's needs to be like this expectation of it's not going to feel good. Mm -hmm. And could you just stay in that? And if you learn to stay in it, it doesn't have to be an unpleasant experience. <clears throat> the building the capacity to be uncomfortable helps. I'm imagining if you gave into it, you might have been a deer in headlights, but you also developed a capacity to go to class. I wasn't there. I'm imagining. Yeah. You developed a capacity to go to class and you kind of knew like, it's, it's going to be uncomfortable today. But I'm still going to roll with it. I'm going to learn. And that's just in class. Like, you learn things outside of, but there is a part of it that's like, all right, I had a commitment to roll with it and learn and not know all of the things. Yeah. And it's a journey. I feel like people, uh, mm -hmm. how can I say this? I feel like people have gotten to this place where we can say out loud and acknowledge that you need to be uncomfortable and it's a journey mm -hmm. and we're buying into the language without going through the experience yeah 100%. it's one thing to say hey y'all let's do it but like but but do it and then mm -hmm. it will be better it's mm -hmm. gonna get better if you just mm -hmm. go in there and do it and a lot of people associate it being uncomfortable or hard or even like it not going well because once you start doing it and you have conversations with people there's a lot of like train wrecks and stuff in there yeah Ooh. And there is an association, like, if it's not going well, you're not doing a good job, so you should pull back. But those oh, yeah. moments of it not going well are the ones you have to be in, you know, and learn yeah. from. That's how they stop happening. Yeah. So I just, there's that part in there that I, I really just wanted to say, I hope people get that. That's part well, of why we're having these conversations. Look, oh, this is what it looks like. Go ahead. No, I think it's really, really, really important to talk about this. And I love to talk about the systemic things that contribute to our action. I think particularly in the United States, I am the same. If I even have a hint of a headache, I'm like, oh, let me grab that headache medicine. If I feel a little bit of swelling in my ankle, let me grab that anti-inflammatory. One, we, we're always looking for solutions to get rid of the discomfort, which I'm not necessarily saying is a bad thing. Who likes the discomfort, right? But we've gotten too used to... Acquiring something to then remove the discomfort. I think the other piece that's really important and problematic is we, my friend and I just had this conversation about this. Sometimes when we feel sad, we think it's like regret and we have to do something to fix the sadness. Sometimes when we feel uncomfortable, we think there's a problem that needs to be solved and therefore to remove the discomfort when it's no, like sadness is just a thing that we feel sometimes. Like discomfort is just a thing yeah. that we yeah. feel sometimes. And when we're in a society that's like, I'm a very solution-oriented person. I love to study and look at, and so it is hard to turn that part off and be like, well, this is what makes me uncomfortable. Why would I just avoid it? Problem solved. If eating too much sugar before a bed gives me a migraine in the morning, I'm not going to eat sugar anymore, right? And so if these conversations are uncomfortable, why would I go into them? But it's look at the systemic way that capitalism especially wants us to just like buy stuff to fix that problem. Do this to fix that. Avoid that bad feeling by eating, drinking, feeling, doing whatever, buying whatever it is. And then just be like, well, I don't have to believe that. I know that sadness will hit me regardless. I know yeah. the discomfort is part of this regardless. Like, we don't have to, not every bad feeling doesn't require a solution. Sometimes it's just a bad feeling that is there because something we're looking at is sad or bad. Racism sucks. I don't like looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I would really like to pull out one more layer of this conversation and help people see what it looks like in moments. So you have mm. already shared like some examples. There's like a in real time situations. Mm -hmm. It could be with one person, it could be with a group of people. 
there is an aspect of your skill set where like you can I don't know how I described it, but it was like you have an awareness of self, but mm-hmm. also you're attuning to other people and dynamics in an interaction with people. And what is your internal process? Because I'm, I know that one layer is that learning that you went through. And the other mm-hmm. is in the moments, you also now have to go through this internal process to then be with people. Because that's also not a got it. I know exactly what to do. I know it's not like that. I'd be having my own internal process to be like, what's going on out here? And like, how do I do this to them? And it happens quickly, but it's a thing. I'm so curious about your internal process. And if you could say it as tangibly as possible, because I think people could benefit from hearing it's your process. too. It doesn't have to be everybody's, but y'all, there's got to be something in there. Do you have one? Yes. And I have to attribute part of it to this amazing counselor that I found in Oregon. His name is Ross Cohen. If you're in Oregon, please go see him. He will. He's amazing. Um, But he talked a lot about a lot of our most heightened reactions come from previous traumas, right? This is not, he's not revolutionary, but the way that he helped me approach it, I felt was revolutionary for me. And so when I'm in that situation where I can feel my heart raise, the cortisol, the adrenaline, I'm like pumping into my brain and I'm just like, face gets red. I have no poker face. It's just like, you know, everyone knows I'm feeling something (laughs) intense. He was like, think of that feeling as your little girl self who went through the poverty, the abuse that you suffered. She is like screaming because something that you're seeing now is reminding her of that time and she's afraid it's happening again. And then Mm -hmm. acknowledge that you can feel your heart pumping. You feel it pounding and you feel it coming. Acknowledge what you're feeling. And you could, it could be a little pitted. It could be a name that you give that feeling. It could be whatever you give that feeling. But one of the things I did before I was in like heightened yeah. scenarios was he had me take, and this is also another revolutionary, but I love it. And I got it from him. So he had me take that little girl traumatized self on a tour led by my like strongest, the person I'm most proud of, my adult self. I took her on a tour of my like current day life, mm-hmm. like what I've accomplished, what I'm proud of, the things I've done, the people that I've served, all of these things to get her to trust me. And then Mm -hmm. when she starts what I call like throwing a tantrum, I can feel that blood boiling and and I'm just nervous or I'm afraid or I'm uncomfortable. She has a lot of different like descriptions of her feeling, right? But I picture her as a little girl crying out. I'm so afraid or I'm so nervous. I'm so scared of this thing. I'm so uncomfortable. And then I like, I'm not joking. Like I dialogue with her and i talk with her as like my adult self and i say yeah. hey i've got this remember when i took you on that tour remember when i showed you all the things that i'm really good at i can do this they and i always thank her i always say thank you so much for being here today but i've got this and i actually like I, I think she's like in my stomach for some reason i have my hands on my stomach and i'm like thank you for being here obviously i'm not saying it out loud but i'm like thank you for being here i've got mm-hmm. this and we're okay and again, like she might keep screaming a little bit, but I'm at least then able to like engage with that more emotionally in control person who can probably do a little bit better job in these spaces where I'm nervous or afraid. That's a major part of it. And then just like acknowledging, yeah. I'm scared. Like when I go to those jails, we're like, you're so brave. Like you just walks right in and teach your classes. That's definitely what it looks like. But that is not what it feels like. I walk in, I'm just like, it's the door. It's you know, every the little wrinkle, but I'm just all right. But I can yeah, and I dialogue and I acknowledge yes, it, and then I just yes. keep it moving. But I also tell people, like I told yes, my students, that yes. and a lot of students would ask me, "Are you afraid to be in here?" And I'd be like, oh, "Yes, Lord, it's like it's terrifying." I'm also really honest. Like I said at the beginning, like I'm just like super honest, super direct. Again, society would tell you emotions are bad and are yeah. and I use a male voice because it's like patriarchal BS. It tells us that's true. And like. <laughs> We're all people. We're all the beings that all the time. Yeah. So just admit what you're feeling, dialogue with yourself, and crunch on through. You're so silly. I can't. <laughs> just you're expressive and it's hilarious. I love that. And to get to that point where you're talking about like the little girl, like any anybody that can do like younger self work is mm-hmm. a gift to the self. I really <sighs> appreciate that. And a lot of people go to therapy to get to that place. And yeah. maybe that's what it is for people. And if not, like I still, if you could get to a place where someone, there's some support to, to gather this information, it's helpful. And I, 
frequently reference the importance of the clinical aspect of Um, DEI work or things in professional settings because there's power in knowing that part of yourself so well. These are the parts of ourselves that we're bringing into work. These are the parts of ourselves that are activated in individual meetings and in group settings. So knowing that is is so helpful because Mm -hmm. then you know what's happening and can speak to this part of yourself. I just Mm -hmm. love everything you said about it. And I there's some other parts too that I you had shared before that I want to just like name. And it was like that you had said something like there's always like that show before the moment there's all that stuff you're describing before like someone gets into the moment is the stuff to sort through and i can't connect with that because before i say anything i have to do the whole there's a whole inside process that i'm having to sort out Mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel good people see the aftermath they see what's said and how it looks and they make assumptions about it's so easy absolutely not not easy there's a whole like you said there's a show going on inside before the moment and then when you're in these moments there's an importance to be able to understand what you're experiencing the feelings and self-regulate so you can stay there yeah and then i don't remember what the other part was but there was just like these little pieces in the moment that i don't know if you remember what i'm talking about if you can just do you know what i'm talking about do you remember, I remember the this? conversation that we had? For me, like you said, it's a lot about awareness. Like the more you know what sets you off or makes you uncomfortable, the easier it is to like check that little kid. Again, it doesn't have to be a little kid that you, but I labeled mine. Yeah. Little kid, so I had a lot of compassion for her. Every time I felt afraid, I had compassion for the little girl who felt it. Oh, something else I always say is like, yeah. the child self is allowed to feel whenever she needs to feel, yeah. but she's not allowed to make any decision. Only my adult self can make those decisions. And so when I've identified mm-hmm. that I'm feeling stuff that child is feeling, I have to like calm her down or she's going to start running the show. And I can't like be out of what would be my sh- anywhere, but especially not in a jail. I don't want to do it in my university classroom. I don't, you know, I get students to challenge what I'm saying and they're very like, well, what about this? But you do have to like maintain, yeah. you can't let the really reactive side of you be the only reaction. I mean, you can, and, and but I don't want to. And so she's allowed to feel, but she's not allowed to make decisions. But again, it's like checking in with yourself. It's mm. grounding yourself in the present moment. If you have to literally do that thing where you're like, what are five things you see? What are three things you hear? Take those breaths where you do like the seven, 11, seven, you breathe in for seven, hold it for 11, Hold, breathe out for seven because one thing when you're feeling those like heightened discomfort feelings you've got cortisol and adrenaline which block your ability to actually make rational decisions that's what cortisol and adrenaline exist for and the higher they go the less able you are to make or respond in like a rational or like your best self way right so like the breathing activity can reduce levels of adrenaline and cortisol like with each round that you do like whatever it is it's finding those strategies to ground yourself in that moment have a, I mean, previously have awareness about what might set you off, prepare yourself to feel uncomfortable, and then do what you can to check in and check that loud little child having a tantrum because you've got work to do. And maybe you probably care about this conversation, which is why you came to it, or you care about this job, which is why you're there. And so all of those, the pre-work and then the present work, like ground yourself yeah. and, and try to reduce that stress so you can interact in the, the, the best way. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I could keep going but i think this is a good place to stop i really thank you for sharing your personal parts of your personal journey allowing us to go into your internal process and how you've grown and what it looks like now and struggling through it and i just i really appreciate that and i hope people found this helpful i feel like at least someone out there has to find this helpful then thanks for modeling what it looks like too to You have, I don't know, you have parts of you that don't have privilege and then you have parts of you that do. Thanks for modeling, just showing up and being like, hey, it sucks over here, but also it's really great for me over here and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Thank you. If someone wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? I think uh, my social media, Instagram is the easiest way to get me. It's just my first name dot last name. So that's my name somewhere on the screen. I don't know. but. Yeah, Lindsay Dot um, I'll put in the description. So we're on the my my organization is called Collaborative <laughs> Voices. It's an educational organization. You could just Google Collaborative Voice or 
sorry, Internet Search Collaborative Voices. And our website will come up. You can also just go to collaborativevoices.co and send a message and it comes right to my email. So you can get in touch with me there or via Instagram. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, if this was of interest to you or maybe it'd be of interest to somebody else, please share and engage in dialogue with people in your network. Of course, like, comment, subscribe. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can visit our website at livingunapologetically.com. We have social media handles on there. You can email us. Uh, There's freebies. There's access to my book, Bias Conscious Leadership, a framework for leading with action and accountability. And other than that, I think that's it. I hope to hear from you soon. And until next time, bye.